Part Two of Lord Tedrick by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lord Tedrick, Part Two. The city of Lumpur, Lomar's capital, lying on the south bank of the Lotar, some fifty miles inland from the delta, nestled against the rugged breast of the coast range. Just outside the town's limit, and some hundreds of feet above its principal streets, there was a gigantic half-bowl, carved out of the solid rock by an eddy of some bygone age. This was the amphitheatre, and on the very lip of the stupendous cliff descending vertically to the river so far below, Losir stood proudly on his platform of smooth, clean granite. "'Tis not enough like a god, methinks,' King Fagon, dressed now in cloth of gold, eyed the gleaming copper statue very dubiously. "'Tis too much like a man by far.' "'Tis exactly as I saw him, sire,' Tedric replied firmly. Nor was he consciously lying. By this time he believed the lie himself. "'Losir is a man-god, remember, not a beast-god, and tis better so. But the time I said is here.' With your permission, sire, I begin. Both men looked around the great bowl. Nearby, but not too near, stood the priestess and a half a dozen white-clad fifteen-year-old girls, one of whom carried a beaten gold pitcher full of perfumed oil, another a flaring open lamp wrought of the same material. Slightly to one side were Rowan, looking, if the truth must be told, as though she did not particularly enjoy her present position on the sidelines, her mother the queen, the rest of the royal family, and ranks of courtiers. And finally, much farther back, at a very respectful distance from their strange new god, arranged in dozens of more or less concentric, roughly hemispherical rows, stood everybody who had had time to get there. More were arriving constantly, of course, but the flood had become a trickle. The narrow way, worming upward from the city along the cliff's stark side, was almost bare of traffic. "'Begin, Lord Tedrick,' said the king. Tedrick bent over, heaved the heavy iron pan containing the offerings up onto the platform, and turned. "'The oil, priestess Lady Tricy, and the flame!' The acolyte handed the pitcher to Tricy, who handed it to Tedrick, who poured its contents over the twin hearts, twin livers, and twin brains. Then the lamp, and as the yard-high flames leaped upward, the armored pseudo-priest stepped backward and raised his eyes boldly to the impassive face of the image of his god. Then he spoke, not softly, but in parade-ground tones audible to everyone present. "'Take, Lord Losir, all the strength and all the power and all the force that Sarpedion ever had. Use them, we beg, for good and not for ill. He picked up the blazing pan and strode toward the lip of the precipice, high-mounting, smoky flames curling backward around his armored figure. And now, in token of Sarpedion's utter and complete extinction, I consign these, the last vestiges of his being, to the rushing depths of oblivion. He hurled the pan and its fiercely flaming contents out over the terrific brink. This act, according to Tedrick's plan, was to end the program, but it didn't. Long before the fiery mass struck water, his attention was seized by a long, low-pitched, moaning gasp from a multitude of throats, a sound the like of which he had never before even imagined. He whirled, and saw, shimmering in a cage-like structure of shimmering bars, a form of seeming flesh so exactly like the copper image in every detail of shape that it might well have come from the same mold. "'Lord Losir, in the flesh!' Tedric exclaimed, and went to one knee. So did the king and his family, and a few of the bravest of the courtiers. Most of the latter, however, and the girl acolytes and the thronging thousands of spectators threw themselves flat on the hard ground. They threw themselves flat, but they did not look away or close their eyes or cover their faces with their hands. On the contrary, each one stared with all the power of his optic nerves. The god's mouth opened, 
His lips moved, and, although no one could hear any sound, everyone felt words resounding throughout the deepest recesses of his being. I have taken all the strength, all the power, all the force, all of everything that made Sarpedion what he was, the god began. In part his pseudo-voice was the resonant clang of a brazen bell, in part the diapason harmonies of an impossibly vast organ. I will use them for good, not for ill. I am glad, Tedric, that you did not defile my hearth, for this is a hearth, remember, and in no sense an altar, in making this the first and the only sacrifice ever to be made to me. You, Trice, are the first of my priestesses." The girl, shaking visibly, gulped three times before she could speak. "'Yea, my—my—' my "'Lord Losir,' she managed finally, "'the—that is, if—if if I please you, Lord Sir.' "'You please me, Trice of Lomar. Nor will your duties be onerous. Being only to see it that your maidens keep my hearth clean and my statue bright.' "'To you, my lord, Losir, lo, sir, all thanks. Wilt keep—' Tricy raised her downcast eyes and stopped short in mid-sentence, her mouth dropping ludicrously open and her eyes becoming two round O's of astonishment. The air above the yawning abyss was as empty as it had ever been. The flesh-and-blood god had disappeared as instantaneously as he had come. Tedric's heavy voice silenced the murmured wave of excitement sweeping the bowl. "'That is all!' he bellowed. I did not expect the Lord Losir to appear in the flesh at this time. I know not when or ever he will deign to appear to us again. But this I know. Whether or not he ever so deigns, or when, you all know now that our great Lord Losir lives. Is it not so? Tis so! Long live Lord Losir! Tumultuous yelling filled the amphitheatre. "'Tis well. In leaving this holy place, all will file between me and the shrine. First our king, then the lady priestess Trice, and her maids, then the family, then the court, then the rest. All men as they pass will raise sword-arms in salute. All women will bow heads. Will be naught of offerings or of tribute or of fractions. Lord Losir is a god— not a huckstering, thieving, murdering trickster. King Fagon, sire, wilt lead? Unhelmed now, Tedric stood rigidly at attention before the image of his god. The king did not march straight past him, but stopped short. Taking off his ornate headpiece and lifting his right arm high, he said, To you, Lord Losir, my sincere thanks for what hast done for me, my family, and for my nation. While tis not seemly that Lomar's king should beg, I ask that you abandon us not. Then Trice and her girls. We engage, Lord Sir, the lady priestess said, at a whispered word from Tedric, to keep your hearth scrupulously clean, your statue shining bright. Then the queen, followed by the lady Rowan, who, although she bowed her head meekly enough, was shooting envious glances at her sister, so far ahead and so evidently the cynosure of so many eyes. The rest of the family, the court, the thronging spectators, and last of all, Tedric himself. Helmet tucked under left arm, he raised his brawny right arm high, executed a stiff left face, and marched proudly at the rear of the long procession. As the people made their way down the steep and rugged path, as they debouched through the city of Lompor, as they traversed the highways and byways back to the towns and townlets and farms from which they had come, it was very evident that Losir had established himself as no other god had ever been established throughout the long history of that world. Great Losir had appeared in person. Everyone there had seen him with his own eyes. Everyone there had heard his voice. 
a voice of a quality impossible for any mortal being, human or otherwise, to produce, a voice heard, not with the ears, which would have been ordinary enough, but by virtue of some hitherto completely unknown and still completely unknowable inner sense or ability evocable only by the god. Everyone there had heard, sensed him address the Lord Armsmaster and the Lady Priestess by name. Other gods had appeared personally in the past, or had they really? Nobody had ever seen any of them except their own priests, the priests who performed the sacrifices and who fattened on the fractions. Lo Seer now wanted neither sacrifices nor fractions, and, powerful although he was, had appeared to and had spoken to every one alike, of however high or low degree, throughout the whole huge amphitheatre. Every one. Not to the priestess alone, not only to those of the old blood, not only to citizens or natives of Lomar, but to every one, down to mercenaries, chance visitors, and such. Long live Lord Losir, our new and plenipotent god. King Fagon and Tedric were standing at a table in the throne room of the palace castle, studying a map. It was crudely drawn and sketchy, this map, and full of blank areas and gross errors, but this was not an age of fine cartography. "'Tark first is still my thought, sire,' Tedric insisted stubbornly. "'Tis closer, our line shorter. A victory there would hearten all our people. Two, twould be unexpected.' Lomar has never attacked Tark, whereas your royal sire and his sire before him each tried to loose Sarlon's grip, and in failing, but increase the already heavy payments of tribute. Two, in case of something short of victory, hast only the one pass and the great gorge of the Lotar to hold against reprisal. Tis true such course would leave the marches unheld, but no more so than they have been for four years or more. Nay, think, man, Fagon snorted testily. Twould fail. Four parts of our army are of Tark. Thinks not their first act would be to turn against us and make common cause with their brethren? Two, we lack strength. They outnumber us two to one. Nay, Sarlon first. Then perhaps Tark. But not before then. But Sarlon outnumbers us two, sire especially if you count those barbarian devils of the Devossian steppes. Since Tagad of Sarlon lets them cross his lands to raid the marches, for a fraction of the loot, no doubt, tis certain they'll help him against us. Also, sire, your father and your grandfather both died under Sarlonian axes. True, but neither of them was a strategist. I am. I have studied this matter for many years. They did the obvious. I shall not. Nor shall Sarlon pay tribute merely. Sarlon must and shall become a province of my kingdom. So argument raged, until Fagon got up onto his royal high horse and declared it his royal will that the thing was to be done his way and no other. Whereupon, of course, Tedric submitted with the best grace he could muster, and set about the task of helping get the army ready to roll toward the marches, some three and a half hundreds of miles to the north. Tedric fumed, Tedric fretted, Tedric swore sulfuriously in Lomarian, Tarkian, Sarlonian, Davosian, and all the other languages he knew. All his noise and fury were, however, of very little avail in speeding up what was an intrinsically slow process. Between times of cursing and urging and driving, Tedric was wont to prowl the castle and its environs. So doing one day, he came upon King Fagon and the Lady Roanne practicing at archery. Lifting his arm in salute to his sovereign and bowing his head politely to the lady, he made to pass on. "'Hola, Tedric!' Roanne called. "'Wouldst speed a flight with us?' Tedric glanced at the target. Rowan was beating her father unmercifully. Her purple-shafted arrows were all in or near the gold, while his golden ones were scattered far and wide, and she had been twitting him unmercifully about his poor marksmanship. 
Fagon was in no merry mood. This was very evidently no competition for any outsider, least of all Lomar's top-ranking armsmaster, to enter. Crave pardon, my lady, but other matters press. Your evasions are so transparent, my lord. Why not tell the truth? Rowan did not exactly sneer at the man's obvious embarrassment, but it was very clear that she, too, was in a vicious temper. Might's not beating me, but never the throne. And any armsmaster who threw us not arrows by hand at this range to beat both of us should be stripped of badge. Tedric, quite fatuously, leaped at the bait. "'Wouldst permit, sire?' "'No!' the king roared. "'By my head, by the throne, by Losir's liver and heart and brain and guts, no! "'Twould cost the head of any save you to insult me so. "'Shoot, sir, and shoot your best!' extending his own bow and a full quiver of arrows. Tedric did not want to use the royal weapon— but at the girl's quick, imperative gesture he smothered his incipient protest and accepted it. "'One sighting shot, sire?' he asked and drew the heavy bow. Nothing whatever could have forced him to put an arrow nearer the gold than the farthest of the king's. To avoid doing so, without transparently missing the target completely, would take skill, since one golden arrow stood a bare three inches from the edge of the target. His first arrow grazed the edge of the butt and was an inch low. His second plunged into the padding exactly halfway between the king's wildest arrow and the target's rim. Then, so rapidly that it seemed as though there must be at least two arrows in the air at once, arrow crashed on arrow, wood snapping as iron head struck feathered shaft. At end, the rent in the fabric through which all those arrows had torn their way could have been covered by half of one of Rowan's hands. I lose, sire, Tedric said stiffly, returning bow and empty quiver. My score is zero. Fagon, knowing himself in the wrong but unable to bring himself to apologize, did what he considered the next best thing. I used to shoot like that, he complained. Knowst how I lost my skill, Tedric? Tis not my age, surely. Tis not my place to say, sire. Then, with more loyalty than sense, and I split to the teeth any who dare so insult the throne. What? the monarch roared. By my... Hold, father, Rowan snapped. A king you, act it. Hard blue eyes glared steadily into the unyielding eyes of green. Neither the thoroughly angry king nor the equally angry princess would give an inch. She broke the short, bitter silence. Say not, Tedric. He is much too fain to boil in oil or flay alive any who tell him unpleasantness, however true. But me, father, you boil not, nor flay, nor seek to punish otherwise, or I split this kingdom asunder like a melon. Tis time, yea, long past time, that someone told you the unadorned truth. Hence, my rascally but well-loved parent, here tis. Hast lolled too long on too many too soft cushions, has emptied too many pots and tankards and flagons, hast bedded too many wenches to be of much use in armor or with any style of weapon in the passes of the high ompassers. The flabbergasted and rapidly deflating king tried to think of some answer to this devastating blast, but couldn't. He appealed to Tedric. Wist have said such? Surely not. Not I, sire, Tedric assured him, quite truthfully. And even if true, tis a thing to remedy itself. Before we reach the marches, wilt regain arm and eye. Perhaps, the girl put in, her tone still distinctly on the acid side. If he matches you, Tedric, in lolling and whining and wenching, yes. Otherwise, no. How much wine do you drink each day? One cup usually, sometimes, at supper. On the march, think carefully, friend. Nay, I meant in town. In the field, none, of course. Ceased, father. What thinkest me, vixen, a spineless cuddle-pet? From this minute till return here, I match your paragon young blade lull for lull, cup for cup, wench for wench. 
Is it what you've been niggling at me to say? Ay, father and king, exactly, for, as you say, you do. She hugged him so fervently as almost to lift him off the ground, kissed him twice, and hurried away. "'A thing I would like to talk to you about, sire,' Tedric said quickly, before the king could bring up any of the matters just passed. "'Armor. There was enough of the god-metal to equip three men fully and headnecks for their horses. You, sire, and me, and Skyro of your guard. Break precedent, sire, I beg, and wear me this armor of proof instead of the gold, for what we face promises to be worse than anything you or I have yet seen. I fear me tis true, but tis impossible none the less. Lomar's king wears gold. He fights in gold. At need he dies in gold. And that was, Tedric knew, very definitely that. It was senseless, it was idiotic but it was absolutely true. No king of Lomar could possibly break that particular precedent. To appear in that spectacularly conspicuous fashion, one flashing golden figure in a sea of dull iron-gray, was part of the king's job. The fact that his father and his grandfather, and so on for six generations back, had died in golden armor could not sway him, any more than it could have swayed Tedric himself in a similar case. But there might be a way out. But need it be solid gold, sire? Wouldst not an overlay of gold suffice? Yes, Lord Tedric, and twould be a welcome thing indeed. But you're not, nor did my father, nor his father, to pit gold against hard-swung axe, e'en less to hide behind ten ranks of iron while others fight but simply tis not possible. If the gold be thick enough for the rivets to hold, tis too heavy to lift. If thin enough to be possible of wearing, the gold flies off in sheets at first blow, and the fraud is revealed. Past ideas? I listen. I know not, sire. Tedric thought for minutes. I have seen gold hammered into thin sheets, but not thin enough but it might be possible to hammer it thin enough to be overlaid on the god-metal with pitch or gum. Wouldst wear it so, sire? Aye, my Tedric, and gladly. Just so the overlay comes not off by hands-breaths under blow of sword or axe. Hands-breaths? Nay. Scratches and mars, of course, easily to be overlaid again ere next day's dawn. But hands-breaths? Nay, sire. In that case, try, and may great Losir guide your hand. End of part two.